and thank you everyone for attending the presentation. Um, I am Davide, I am software analyst here at RIA UK. Um, very good. Uh, and um, with Adria today, uh, we will go to a technology that we are currently using uh, um, here in office um, to handle our raster data and our time series data. The agenda for today is uh, I will go uh, I will do a brief introduction about the technology. Uh, explaining why we think it's a good tool and why we are using it. Uh, and then Adria uh, will go more in depth into the subject and will show us also some live demo so that we can see how the DataCube works in practice and uh, we can uh, appreciate more the real power of the technology. And then we will have a, session, uh, a space for question and answer. Um, so, um, the technology we talk about today is Open DataCube. Uh, open DataCube is an open source tool. That, uh, this, uh, the development of the tool started three years ago, but um, uh, it has been open to the public only one year ago. The code is um, available to the public through GitHub. Um, in the, the two main contributors to the project are Geoscience Australia and CIOS, but there are also other contributors like uh, CISARO and uh, NASA, for example. And uh, Open Data Cube, uh, the main aim, uh, aim of the tool is to uh, provide um, a tool that uh, lo uh, lowers the technical barriers for users to exploit data to its full potential. So with this tool, we want to ha um, uh, help users uh, to uh, care only about uh, implementing their, uh, their algorithm and not about uh, data preparation and uh, data uh, management. Uh, in fact, you say, uh, the main problem for user is uh, data access, data preparation, and a set of uh, analysis algorithms to extract information from from the data. And uh, Open Data Cube try to address all these problems, and uh, that's also something more. So to Open Data Cube, we can serve analysis ready data. Analysis ready data means data that are ready to be Analysis, analyzed, ready to be exploited. Uh, to, uh, so uh, the user doesn't need to pre-process the data locally. To uh, DataCube also, uh, we can access the data in a very uh, easy and user-friendly way uh, to different tools we can use, like an uh, in-browser IDE, which is called Jupyter, so the user doesn't need to install any software, but just through the browser, he can start loading this data and start working on the data. And, uh, and then also can stream his data uh, to front-end web app, uh, to web app, so to a front-end, and also can stream the data to their favorite tool for data analysis, like QGIS and ArcGIS to the WMS and the, the WCS protocol. So really, uh, Open Data Cube has uh, um, uh, a lot of features and is a, a tool that try to address many, uh, many of these problem, like, uh, many problems, like another problem that try to, uh, try to sort is the, um, we want to provide an efficient time series analysis tool to support the line change application. So this is another uh, uh, feature of, of Open Data Cube. And uh, today, Adria, we'll go through all these features and we'll go in depth uh, into one, each one of these features and show for each one of these a live demo so that uh, we can appreciate better and understand better how Data Cube can be helpful for us and how Data Cube is helping us currently here at Rio. Thank you, Davide. <coughs> So, Earth observation data is of big value because if one is able to extract useful information from it, it can be of help in management in the management of disasters, in the hydrology or geology of a terrain, in the mapping of a terrain, 
in the threshing or the agriculture of a, of a country, etc. By making, by giving the means to take good decisions. However, often, one, when analyzing this data, finds that software is often limited or has restricted functionality, such as it may not have all the math operations that uh, one may require or all the, all the tools that um, may be needed. So there's one big feature in Open Data Cube, and is that Open Data Cube, the community has built the tools for Open Data Cube on top of Python, the programming language. This programming language has many existing Earth observation libraries ready to deal with any kind of Earth observation data, such as the GDAT Python bindings um, for Python, or if you want to do any more advanced numerical things, such as machine learning, you can use the scikit learn. Um, on the other hand, we have that this language, it is both re um, really easy to read and to code. So that makes users of um, Python able to focus on the problem they want to solve and the scientific problem they want to solve rather than on the coding itself. And moreover, this language is a, a language familiar in the scientific community and also in the, it's very familiar to many software developers. So that enhanced collaborations between teams. All of this brings a minimization, minimization of the time required to solve a problem and also the knowledge barrier to, to solve the problem is minimized. So now I'll walk you through um, quite quickly, quickly through our demo. in which we will compute an NDVI anomaly. So before going in, in here, uh, this thing you are seeing on my screen is a Jupyter notebook. So I don't have anything installed on my computer to uh, analyze the data we are going to analyze. I'm just accessing the server, which is in the cloud. And through this uh, web browser, through this Jupyter notebook, I'm also going to access our Open Data Cube, which is also running on the cloud. So the NDVI is a vegetation index. And I'm going to go very quickly through the, through the code. So I'm going to import some Python libraries. Um, some of these libraries are related to our observation. Now what I'm doing is accessing the Open Data Cube through its API, which is built on top of Python. Um, now, here I have the list of data that we have currently in this Open Data Cube. Uh, for this problem, I'm going to uh, select Landsat uh, 8. Um, previously, I have um, selected a region of interest. I'm, I don't know if you are able to see my screen. Can somebody say something? Yes. So do you see everything white? Yeah, I see meta, metadata report. And that's it, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's loading because uh, the network is quite slow. So as we are streaming and plus loading the data, so there is yeah, it's a bit slow, but it will come up soon. Just a second. Or we can start going forward. Because yeah, we, we can go forward and see. Okay. Now because, see if that's something else. Yeah, the map so will uh, we'll show. Yeah, so here. basically what was before is um, it was represented at the, our region of interest, um, but it turns out that with the streaming, um, something yeah, yeah. Um, so what you see here that there's a lot of numbers is um, the data that we have created through open data cube um, what I'm going to do now is to compute the NDVI anomaly I'm going to select a snapshot 
of decision of interest of ours. And then I'm going to select uh, three snapshots to create a base layer so that I can compute the anomaly. Then I have to select other parameters that are that are out of the scope of the of this uh, talk. Um, and I'm running more code. And um, what I'm doing now is I'm removing the clouds of the picture. Um, to do that, I'm using data that I have queried through I have um, received from Open Data Cube. So it's taking a while because um, it's well, it's removing the clouds and it's a large area. So that's normal. But then, if you look here, um, that's the formula to compute the NDVI. And this is what I was referring before that. Python is a very familiar language. It's a very easy to read and understand language for anyone, even for not so technical people. So that is what enhances collaboration between in teams. So um, here, what I'm representing is the NDVI um, for our region of interest um, from which we want to compute the anomaly. And here I am representing the base layer from which I'm going to compute the, ND, the NDVI. So again, just using very easy to understand syntax, um, I'm obtaining the anomaly. So in this case, um, where it's more purple, there's more anomaly. Um, this is just a sample data. But with this example, I just wanted to show you how easy it is to Run, um, run code uh, with Python and with data that was obtained from OpenNotaQ. So another thing with Earth observation data is that often you want you need um, more than a set of uh, of data or files for your region of interest. So um, that's one problem. Another problem that you can have when uh, dealing with Earth observation data is that you need it often to be projected in a certain projection. Um, so you need to be projected it into your map. Um, moreover, as data is split in, in different files, time series can be difficult to handle or to analyze. So overall, we need flexibility when uh, studying and analyzing the observation data. So how Open Data Cube can help with that? So first of all, Open Data Cube um, is a technology specially developed to deal with time series uh, analysis. So that when you query data from Open Data Cube, when you fetch data from Open Data Cube, what you're getting is a cube of data of at least three dimensions. So you have the latitude and longitude dimensions because you're querying data from a map. But then you have at least the third dimension, which is going to be the time. Um, with this third dimension, you're ready to do any kind of time series analysis. Moreover, as uh, this is not a feature of Open Data Cube itself, but of Python, um, but I remind you that uh, the tools for Open Data Cube have been, have been built on top of Python. Um, so Python has a lot of libraries to change the projection of your data set. So overall, it's a good tool. Open that it's a good tool. Okay. So what I'm going to show you now is I'm going to show you how easy it is to combine data that has been received, served through Open Data Cube. So what we are going to do is we're going to see how the organization in Kampala, which is the capital of Uganda, um, has changed within 15 years. So again, going quickly through the code, um, I have queried before some some data from the Open Data Cube, 
And to see this change in the organization, we are going to use an index called the build up index, which is represented by this formula. And again, with just very easy to understand syntax, I'm computing this index. Um, this is how the map of this index looks like if you are using a red um, color palette. And I'm just now going to take the difference between Landsat 8 and Landsat 7, which are two different kinds of data in this line. And this is the output. So as you have seen, I haven't had to deal with, I haven't had to spend much time in preparing the data so that it is comp compatible with another kind of data. Because Open Data Cube served me the data in the same format, in the same structure. So also what you can do is um, you can use more data um, from Open Data Cube to, for example, to mask out, mask out water. So this um, area here that you see in white is uh, water that has been masked out using data that we have um, uh, obtained through Open Data Cube. So I'm going just a second that I lost the PowerPoint. Okay, we're back. So also related to this thing I was just explaining to you now. Um, as a user of the data, we often have to deal with different file formats different file names, different naming conventions, different structures in the data. So how can Open Data Cube ease um, the trouble of um, dealing with all these problems? So the first thing open, you do in Open Data Cube is you index the data um, so that when you are going to use Open Data Cube, you will always receive the data in the same format because Open Data Cube is going to do the job for you of um, remembering what is the naming convention, uh, the file formats, etc. Another thing in Open Data Cube is that you can ingest data. What does that mean? So often when you receive data or you download data, that is given to you in an archival format. However, you may uh, always need this data to solve a particular problem. Uh, maybe you want this data in a particular projection, in a smaller chunk than the data that you receive, etc. So you can ingest data in Open Data Cube um, tailored to your needs, and that will translate to you as a having an enhancement in the computational performance. Uh, another point is that in Open Data Cube, we expect to receive analysis ready data because in the end, what we want to do is, analysis, is analyze this data. So I'll just walk you, again, I'll show you another uh, example if I'm able to see my screen. So what I'm going to show you is, I'm going to show you different sets of data. And you're going to, sh to see that all of them, uh, you receive all of them in the same format. And if yeah, I don't, you can't see my screen, right? Yes. 
So the data is loaded, but because of the streaming, it's not displaying. Yeah. Let's see if we are more lucky with this one. Okay, so if we were able to see the whatever is hidden here, we would see that it had the same structure as this, but the data that we have would that we have here is um, meteorological data. The data that we have here is data coming from uh, an image from Sentinel-1. What we are going to do now is get also Landsat-7 data, which is another satellite. And again, we receive the data in the same structure. And uh, now the data for Landsat 8. And we just save the data again in the same structure. And in all these cases, we haven't had to remember which are the file names of the files, uh, how they are structured, um, if they come in one single file, or they come stated in different files, etc. So, Last point. Um, I'm working in a project called uh, Drawdown for Mitigation Service, DFMS for short. And in this project, um, we aim to to use Earth observation data to solve problems, um, drought and flood problems in, in Uganda. However, um, Open Data Cube requires a manual, uh, when you add a data set, you need to do them manually. Or if you need to manage data, so basically by managing it, I mean to move the data from one location to another. So it's like special to open the cube. Um, you, do, you need to do that manually. So uh, we have built a platform that is able to cope with these problems. And also, it is able to cope with the indexation and the ingestion of data into our open data cube. So what I'm going to show you now is if I'm a user and I don't have a platform such as this one, um, what would I have, what would I require to do? So what I'm going to show you now is how we would index into that acute Sentinel-2 data. So, okay, it seems like this screen is not working again, but uh, you have to trust me here. Um, in the list of, of products of Open Data Cube, um, there is no Sentinel-2. So now I'm manually registering that I want to add Sentinel-2 into the Open Data Cube, so basically giving the metadata like um, the instrument, um, the platform, etc. So everything related to Sentinel-2. Now I'm adding it. Um, yeah, you have to trust me again here but you can probably trust me because here there were one, two, three, four, five items in the list. Now there are um, seven items. Um, these two other items are Sentinel-2A and Sentinel-2B, which are the two satellites of Sentinel-2. And now, if I query Sentinel-2 data, what they see is that there is no data because they haven't indexed any data of Sentinel-2. I have just registered that I want to um, um, put Sentinel data into the open data cube. So now what I need to do is to manually create a configuration file, which is going to be tailored for the data set that I want to index. And this has to be done manually at this point. And now I'm adding it. And I'm rerunning the same code as in here. I 
And we will see that now we have Sentinel-2 data because we have indexed it manually to open the queue. However, if we have a platform such as the one we are using, you can do this automatically and just care about using the data and not managing the data. So this is the Sentinel-2 data that we have just indexed into our open data queue. So last point, as David mentioned in the beginning, um, you can also use open data queue not only to uh, do analysis on Earth observation data, but also to serve data to users. So you can serve data using the WCS or WMS protocols, which are OGC standards, to build front-end applications or also to desktop applications such as RGS or QGS. So here on the right of my screen, you can see a screenshot of our QGS application in which we create some metadata that we have in our open data cube. This is an air pressure layer. And this has been possible because the, this layer was served through the UCS. So summing up the Open Data Cube, it was designed to analyze satellite data. However, we have proof that we can use any Earth observation data set as long as we have the knowledge to do it. Because as I remind you, open it's an open source project, which makes it that the code you write and the code that it is written is auditable. Um, so if you need anything, you can always go inside the code and check how it works and make sure that that it does what you expect it to do. On the other hand, we have that the tools have on top of uh, open data cube of on top of open data cube have built have been built in in Python, which is good for development and analytics, especially for people who need to solve scientific problems and they don't need to develop software. Um, that also brings that the collaboration within teams is encouraged because Python is very familiar and very easy to read and code at the same time. So now if you have questions, we will be very pleased to answer them. Are you hearing me? Yes, yes. sure, sure. Ciao, Davide, ciao. Oh. Uh, uh, on three questions. Uh, first of all, I uh, noticed that you put collaboration is encouraged. Uh, I, I don't know, but there is any chance for external users uh, as guest users to access to your platform uh, to work on data or to create some uh, analysis? Uh, yeah, um, so the collaboration is, uh, uh, is very welcome. Uh, like at the moment we are using our tool only internally, so the data as our data coming for our partner, now we are using the data only internally but uh, probably in the future uh, why not it's uh, like uh, having a platform that everybody can access so that they can create their own um, the, their own algorithm would be uh, very nice to have but at the moment uh, the platform is available only for our uh, for internal use uh, for our partners but we hope it to probably open uh, to public, but anyway, everybody can be uh, like uh, if uh, someone has some some data and want to use op open uh, open data cube, there is a tool called Jupyter Hub that allows multi users to authenticate and access uh, their data through Jupyter uh, Jupyter notebook. But yeah, uh, currently our ARD data are not publicly available. Okay, and um, uh, when you show that uh, uh, you provide data 
time series or um, uh, earth observation uh, already analyzed to the users who can work uh, with ArcGIS or QGIS uh, in uh, another platform. But uh, uh, the DFMS provide also the platform to the user to have different uh, tools uh, to be used or the users need to have uh, in the local uh, PC the um, application? Uh, yes, uh, with uh, the FMS, uh, our aim is to provide to the partners and to the scientists and to users a platform in, um, uh, to analyze the data so they don't need to install anything, but through the Jupyter Hub and Jupyter Notebook, we will uh, set up uh, and we are setting up a uh, a cluster, uh, so they have plenty of resources, computational resources to run their own algorithm. So yeah, we will provide this, and they are free to run any kind of uh, code that they want. They can be okay. scaled. The platform can be scaled uh, horizontally very, very easily and well. Okay, I'm I'm verifying this. <laughs> okay. <and laughs> oh, yeah, you uh, maybe you will be one of our users. <laughs> you, uh, <laughs> but now it's uh, still in an initial stage. <laughs> okay. The, the last question, and um, I don't know if you know. Uh, I, I'm working uh, in the long-term data preservation, and I'm managing the historical data. Uh, I'm an attendee of CIOS. In particular, I know the Open Data Cube when uh, the idea started. And uh, I know that there is the limitation of, uh, on this kind of data cube because you need the uh, um, ARD format. And I know that they are starting with the on-demand uh, Open Data Cube. In, I think that it could be a service in which uh, uh, you can um, uh, have the data in ARD format. I think that it could be really, really useful if uh, the RIA data cube uh, can uh, work on this because uh, if you need to understand uh, a real uh, time series, you need to include also historical data. At the moment, ERS and MBSAT, the long time data series, uh, ESA data series, uh, is not in ARD, ARD uh, format. And at the moment, uh, you can't work on it. But I think that for the future, uh, if you demonstrate that you can use also ERS and MBSAT, it's really um, important for ESA. Yeah, you are totally right. And uh, now, uh, in our platform, we use Landsat 7, Landsat 8, Sentinel 2, Sentinel 1, and they are provided by our partner in ARD format. So, in our uh, real data cube, we will have ERD data, but we don't have ERS data and we don't have MBSAT. But uh, why, if it will be an algorithm or if we develop an algorithm, to create a ARD data automatically on the fly, because also the concept of ERD data means analysis ready data, but depends a lot on the usage, so on the kind of, or end of the quantity of pre-processing that you want of the data. We can uh, for sure implement and, and store this data into data cube, but the main problem is understanding the need of the user, so understanding which level of processing the final user needs and develop an algorithm to produce the ARD image and then uh, for sure we can integrate it into Open Data Cube. Yeah, yeah because uh, you have uh, uh, new data, you haven't uh, the real historical data. Yes. To, create, to understand the, cha the climate change or the uh, really changes in the weather, no? Okay, but, um, but uh, yeah, we can, we can chat, chat uh, in another moment uh, about some ideas. Uh, sure. To, we, we can implement inside. Sure. USGS, they are providing for the USA, uh, Landsat uh, uh, 7 and 8 ARD data that are historical, but they processed all the data already. But this can be done, and we can have a chat later and... Uh, talk about that more <laughs> in depth. Okay. 
Thank you. Thank you for the interesting uh, presentation. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, sorry, Alessandro Scrivin. I have a question about the the data you you are you are providing or, or you are using in the sense that you show that you can select a free free or full snapshot for, for a specific timeline. And so I would like to know if there is a way to uh, get this data directly from the service provider, that data provider, or if uh, we are talking about data that are already stored in your data tube. Um, the data um, are meant to be stored on the flight. Like our uh, this year, uh, the DFMS project is meant to be a live service. So every day we will receive data from partner and automatically uh, through our platform, we will um, save the data uh, into DataCube so that the user will have access uh, to all the data that we have on the platform, if this answers your question. Uh, okay, so, so it is something that is connected to the, to the users. So the data provider are, are the partners, not users. So data provider are the partners. Yes, are the partners. data provider are the partner. Okay, so the selection of data is limited to the data that are uh, present in the yes in the data cube. Ah, okay. Now I thought that that, that that could be the possibility to uh, select uh, based on the area of interest uh, and 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 the date was the possibility to retrieve the data from the data sources. Uh, no, the user will provide the, the data, it will be stored into DataCube and the user can access that data. Then maybe in future we will have the possibility to store uh, the result of the analysis, but this needs to be uh, discussed and see who is allowed, because otherwise we will have a huge database. <laughs> No, no, I can imagine there is also yeah. a problem that uh, that uh, each 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 data has its own format and and, and you need many processors as as the number of uh, yes exactly formats I know because of working on that okay <laughs> uh, sorry to 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 um, to solve this problem uh, the only the only way is to uh, Link uh, the uh, Open Data Cube with the catalog. No, uh, if, if you in the future, if you want to create a catalog, you can select uh, a polygon or uh, other thing or a pixel uh, mode, and uh, you can retrieve uh, uh, the result of the data cube. Uh, yes, you can uh, uh, you can load the data for the area that you uh, that you want. You can query the data because um, during uh, um, there are two aspects here. During the ingestion process, you tile so you divide the data in tiles. So actually, you can query the tile you want or the area of interest you want already. Second thing, um, a second thing um, with DataCube, you can store all your data and have all your data in S3 buckets, for example, if you use uh, Amazon AWS. So you have a very cheap way to store a big amount of data, and, uh, and then you can stream your data in your web app or uh, in your uh, ID in browser. And you can already um, query only the portion of data, only the layer you need. The only problem that after you uh, the result of your uh, analysis cannot be uh, like uh, it's very hard to save it back now into DataCube because each person has its own needs and uh, the database can uh, will grow exponentially depending on the number of the user. Plus, uh, our server uh, like uh, the more a user you add and the more process you run, as Alessandro was uh, saying before. The more power, the more computational power you need. So there are all aspects that need to be taken in consideration. So you need a sort of control of, of it. Hello. Um, hey, hello. I can I can add to this as well. We're, we're looking at um, how how different multiple data cubes can be connected together uh, for different scenarios, like the ones that you're asking about. Um, one one scenario might be that one 
cube is holding ARD data for the whole of the history of a particular spacecraft or the whole history for um, a particular region, say. And then uh, you then may be able to then have specific or user owned data cubes which, which are connected to that in somehow. And so your question about the catalog is something that we've started to design a, a cataloging system for open data cube that works across multiple cubes. And we hope that that might get implemented quite soon. And, and so we're sort of working towards the, the notion of multiple data cubes in a federated sense with different purposes um, all connected together so you can um, organize analysis over wide you know wide areas or, or different networks beyond the scope of a, a, a local cube but there's some work to be done there yes exactly So just so there was one of the hi there it's uh, Paul Healy here um, I'm the project manager for DFMS um, just on one of the, the things that came up there about uh, the user area uh, where a user uh, could uh, potentially load a shape file uh, or load data in and then be able to do some analysis um, uh, based on the data in the data cube against some some of their own information you see that as a it's a quite a useful tool for customers. Uh, obviously, it needs to have some sort of limitation on the amount of data. Um, and one of the potential use cases of that we've seen so far has been um, NARO in Uganda, which is the National Agriculture Research Organization, which are, is an advisory body into the Ugandan government. And uh, one aspect we're looking at with them is potentially having uh, crop calendars, so information on how how crops can behave related to different uh, weather, for, weather forecasts and other indices. Um, so we see that as quite a, quite a useful tool to, to, to work on. Are there any other questions? Uh, I have a question about, um, so you said that the, all the air situation data is freely available on the Open Data Cube. What would that mean in terms of the security of the data that is on the Data Cube? Um, about security, um, well, the security can be implemented in uh, many ways. Um, at the moment, uh, the data are freely available to partners, uh, and uh, the security can be done on two sides. You, we, uh, you can have security because anyway, to access the cluster and access the platform, anyway, you need some uh, security protocol to access to actual uh, computing resources. So anyway, you cannot download the data because you don't have the username and password and the authentication to access the data. And then you can have also security at the database level. And then you can have a security also on the web app level. So you have a different level of security can, that can be put in place. And so uh, it really depends on the, on the use case and uh, on the level of security that, uh, that you want. So if you are determined to be Freely available anyway. You need the kind of security because you cannot allow everybody uh, to use the platform at the same time, unless you don't have the resources available for it. Okay, thank you. Yes. Is there any any other question you can answer? Perhaps another point that on security in, in terms of the Jupyter notebooks and access to the public, there is um, they're, they're quite open, they're quite powerful tool which gives access to the uh, underlying computing resources. So it's a tool which you kind of tend to use for development purposes or within a trusted environment rather than um, putting out to the general public on the web because there's uh, scope for abuse there. 
I think for the DFMS, they're using that as a tool for um, uh, certain expert uh, GIS users, but most most of the services will be developed in the background, perhaps using Jupyter Notebook, but then encoded into a um, like a more of the formal um, service as part of the application that has its own dedicated web front end. Yes. Any other question? Uh, I have a question. Uh, which are the parameters uh, we can say that you are using or that you have developed the tool for till, till now? So, I mean, now you just show us the NDY, but for the draft, I think there are many other parameters. Is there are any of these already available or? There are uh, some tests made of, on that. At the, uh, at the moment, uh, we are in a prototyping phase, so uh, we come to have as indexes. We have NDVI, we have uh, the um, uh, some other indexes uh, linked to the vegetation. Uh, we uh, we will have an hydrological uh, model. We will have the land usage uh, as well. Uh, so these are all raster. Some are time series, some are not. But uh, still, uh, all this uh, information will be provided by uh, by the partner. We will have also weather forecast data, climate data. Uh, uh, as well, so, so we will have historical data and weather forca forecast data. So we, uh, we will have a very mixed uh, kind of data, and uh, and then after that, um, the part in which we will integrate all this information and uh, the code that we will put all the, this information together to create the map of uh, risk of drought and flood still, uh, needs still to be created, but we will arrive soon. We will have also, I don't know, soil master, uh, for example, from Sentinel-1. And uh, so, yes, yeah, there is a very wide range of information. Yeah, the soil moisture is quite a good example because we got the um, soil moisture from satellite data sources. It's coming from SMOS, and uh, the, the, the team are working on uh, bringing Sentinel-3 data into that product as well. But the, the kind of uh, fun thing, the exciting thing, if you like, is where we're feeding the uh, weather data that we're getting from the UK Met Office and feeding that through the hydrological model, we're generating um, forecast products, so we're forecasting the soil moisture and, and other variables as well as just monitoring it. Yeah, and another nice aspect is that uh, this data will be validated using uh, ground data as well. So there is also this aspect. But yeah, it's a very uh, wide range uh, multidisciplinary project. I should have another question, but probably is more is more technical because it is about uh, how you manage the different uh, spatial resolution of the data. But I think it's something that is going out of topic, probably. Yeah, Open Data Cube offered the feature of uh, resampling on the fly, or you can uh, uh, um, you can uh, index uh, the uh, you can ingest the data with the uh, uh, and uh, you have some resampling uh, algorithm, and so you can um, uh, like resampling all the data to a common uh, sampling rate. But this um, we are still discussing on it, and this is a decision also taken with partners. So it's uh, something now that uh, will become and will become from the partner. Okay, thanks. Let's see the first results. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> definitely. <laughs> <laughs>